So in episode five, we talked about our massive 21 kilowatt uh, lithium iron phosphate install for our inverter system here that was 25% of the weight of lead acid and less in cost. And that sparked a ton of questions from a lot of people, you know, about how the heck did you pull that off? And is it safe to put uh, lithium in your boat? Uh, how did you install it? Uh, what does it weigh? You know, all kinds of different questions that are super important. So we're gonna spend some time answering all of those questions. So the first question everyone is asking is how much do these batteries cost? John? So right now used, these batteries you can get on eBay anywhere from $350 to $550. Now you might go, oh, wait a minute, um, I can get a lead acid battery uh, that's 12 volt that uh, you know has 140 amps uh, for $150, what gives? So let's do some quick math. So these particular batteries, we're gonna to have to talk about wattage. And the reason we're gonna talk about wattage is wattage is basically your voltage times your amperage, and that each equals your wattage, okay? On these particular batteries, you can use literally 80% of the wattage. And these batteries have 138 amps at 12.8 volts is what they're nominally rated at. So you can get 1,766 watts. Now, if you go take a lead acid battery that has 12 volts and is rated for 140 amps, you know, you'll go through and you'll say, okay, well, I can get 1,680 uh, watts out of that. Problem is you can only use half of the rating on those batteries. So that means really you're only gonna get uh, 840 watts out of that. So now you have to buy two lead acid batteries for every one of these. Now. Again, you might look at that and go, all right, well, fine. I have to buy two of those lead acid batteries. I just popped 300 bucks. John, you're still talking 350 to you know, $550 for these batteries. And this is where it gets interesting, is a lead acid battery will give you about 200 to 400 cycles, 400 cycles if you absolutely baby the battery. These particular batteries will give you 4,000 cycles. So 10 times as many cycles. So that means you have to buy $3,000 worth of lead acid batteries to match one of these $350 to $550 batteries. Um, now, when we talk about these batteries, they're used, okay? Um, and out of 4,000 cycles, all these used batteries have only been used anywhere from 50 to 80 cycles or the ones that we have in our system. That's pretty slick. Um, that means that we really have you know, a ton of life left on these particular batteries. So they're pretty much new for us. Quite frankly, they're $2,500 brand new each. So they're a fraction of what they cost brand new. So John, where did these batteries come from? So these batteries, they're actually out of a Staples delivery truck. In the year 2008, uh, when we had the last recession, uh, Obama went through and with his stimulus package, they pushed a ton of money into renewable energy. And there was a company at the time that unfortunately went bankrupt called Smith Trucking. They used to build these delivery trucks that had a bunch of clean energy, these lithium iron phosphate batteries in them. They were used obviously very rarely uh, since I only have about 40 to 80 cycles on these batteries. So when it came time to scrap that truck, these are the batteries that came out of it. And you'll tend to see a lot of these coming out, out on eBay uh, or they'll have other resellers that do a really good job of checking them, giving you all the vital stats of the batteries, etc. But that's where they're all coming from. They're coming out of these uh, either, you know, trucks or other type of implementations. So how do you know what condition the batteries are in and if they're defective or not? So what's amazing about these batteries, because they are industrial, they basically have a communications port on each one of them. Uh, 
with that communications port, it tracks a bunch of information about each one of the modules. Things like how many cycles has it had? Um, has it had any over voltage, under voltage, over temp, under temp? Uh, type of conditions. You can even see down to each one of the groups of cells to understand exactly uh, how well they're matched within the battery. So you have a really good idea the exact profile of each one of these batteries. Uh, I just was able to go online and find the software uh, by Valance and be able to create a connector plug that I just connected my PC to, so I, had, I was able to see all this information. So I know exactly what these batteries uh, look like, what their health is, and you can't say that about any other second-hand battery that I've seen uh, that's out on the market right now. Is there a warranty, and what do you do if you need service? That's a super good question. Uh, because these are aftermarket, Lithium Works, which makes Valance, uh, they don't do anything for the secondhand market. They won't even talk to you, to be honest with you. So what I did about warranty and service, I bought an extra one of these. That's my warranty. If one of them dies, I pop it back in here and I just keep it topped off. It only burns like 2% of amperage per month. So I just have to keep track of it every six months, charge it up a little bit. That's my warranty. So what kind of quality of batteries are we talking about, John? It's a good question. Uh, there's a lot of Chinese batteries out there, uh, you know, prismatic batteries, etc. Uh, that you know the quality is dodgy at best. Um, if you look on, uh, just do a quick search on YouTube, you can actually find uh, these Valence batteries where people have torn them apart uh, to see what's inside of them, and they're pretty amazing. They have four different temperature sensors that are in these. Uh, they have a, a unit that's built into them that keeps track of obviously all the stats that we talked about, but also uh, it has active equalization of all the cells that take place in them. Uh, it has great uh, insulation in them from both a vibration standpoint as well as these cases are actually a fire resistant case. On top of it, uh, they are UL certified as well as being IP65 waterproof. Um, they are set up for industrial uh, usage and specifically in the marine environment as well. So that gave me a great deal of confidence that these were right up there with the best of the batteries that were out on the market. So I heard that you can't get a BMS with these. Are they useless without one? So since these batteries are basically built in what they call a U27 configuration or group 27 configuration, they're really about the same size as the, the battery that's in your car. Um, so that actually makes them kind of a slick setup. You can use them as a drop-in application if you just needed one of these batteries, um, or if you just set them up in a 12 volt configuration, they equalize across themselves because they're in parallel. So that being said, if you had a inverter or some other load that was able to cut off uh, the charge when it gets to a particular level or cut off the discharge when it gets to, you know, 11 and a half volts and you want to be able to protect the batteries, uh, you could just do it that way and you don't really need a BMS. However, if you're going to configure them like we did in a group of series and then run in parallel together, that's where the BMS comes in and you do need one. Um, and the trick is too, these BMSs, they're programmed specifically for the configuration of your battery bank. So it used to be because Valance didn't support these batteries in the aftermarket, you couldn't get a BMS, and that caused a lot of problems for a lot of people. However, um, Muller Industries is a great company that I got a hold of. Um, some really neat people, uh, Seth and Rudy. They were able to create and program a BMS specifically for Valance batteries. So all of a sudden, all these people that used to own these batteries and really couldn't connect them in series and be able to manage the cutoffs as well as balancing across the series uh, configuration in the battery banks, now there's a solution. Uh, it's a pretty slick setup. They configure it for your particular bank and they're coming out with uh, CAN bus integration. So pretty soon I'll be able to integrate it into my Victron system. 
in addition, you'll be able to connect them to your computer uh, and be able to look at software very similar to the software that I showed earlier that shows exactly what the status of the entire battery bank is. So good news, you can actually get a BMS for these. Is there a battery management system in the battery? Um, and the architecture in Valence batteries is a little different because it is built to have massive scale in an industrial type of application. Inside the battery, they do have electronics that basically track all of the events throughout the lifetime of the battery, but it also has an equalization circuitry built into it. And what it does is if there's particular cells that will uh, charging vary by 40 millivolts, it actually starts discharging those particular cells and takes that charge and applies it over to the cells that are lower. So it's a pretty slick uh, equalization system that's inside the battery. But is it a BMS when you talk about being able to cut off the battery if it gets into a high voltage or low voltage state that's gonna hurt the battery? No, it doesn't. Do you use a contactor for high and low voltage contact? Contactor, cut out. Do you use a contactor for high and low voltage cutouts? That's the right Same question. Right Is that the right thing? <laughs> Is that the right question? Do you use a contactor for high and low voltage cutout? So while this BMS can control contactors for both high and low voltage cutout of the battery bank, that's not something that we have to really worry about in this situation because uh, my Victron inverter uh, is able to shut off charging at a particular voltage and shut off the inverter when we get to a low state as well. So in our system, we decided not to use a contactor for high and low voltage cutout. Are lithium batteries safe? because I know that they can catch on fire. So lithium batteries can catch on fire. However, these are lithium iron phosphate batteries. So the chemistry is completely different on them, even though they do contain lithium. It makes them super stable uh, and you don't have a lot of worries around them catching on fire. So how much do the batteries weigh a piece and what is the total weight? So these weigh 42 pounds a piece. Uh, there's 12 of them, so 502 pounds. Now, the reason that kind of even matters, uh, to be able to get the type of wattage that we get out of these uh, with AGM, it would be 2,300 pounds. So four and a half times the weight to be able to get this kind of energy um, out of a comparable AGM. What is the difference? in installing a lithium iron phosphate battery compared to a lead acid or AGM? That's a good question. And there is a big difference. Um, and it's just how you install them. Cause it, it, basically an AGM battery and a lead acid battery can't sustain the type of current flows that lithium iron phosphate can. And when I say that, I mean, the current flows are massive, both when they're charging. So these particular batteries, they're 138 amps. You can charge these at 70 amps. That's a ton of amperage that you're pushing when you're charging these. The cool part is that means that they can get charged really fast and you can start using them again. Um, the downside is with that kind of massive amperage flowing through your cables, um, and across all of the batteries, you better have equal resistance all the way across the board. The other side is you can literally discharge these batteries at 150 amps, which is higher than the available amperage on the battery. And you can actually, for a short amount of time, be able to pull 300 amps off of each battery. Um, so when we talk about the massive amounts of current that can flow off of these, it's great to be able to power, you know, an inverter system, but it also means, like I said, you have to be able to make sure that uh, all of your battery cables are of equal length because even a difference in your positive and negative cables uh, in inches uh, with those types of current flows, it can make a difference and you start creating heat. Another one is um, when you think about when you torque down each one of these connections, they need to be torqued exactly the same way. So we actually have a, a torque wrench to be able to torque each one of these down. Um, another thing that you have to take into account, you can't put washers or anything else that's gonna vary the resistance in each one of these uh, cable connections. And let's see, what else? Oh, 
once you do get it installed, uh, you need to be able to test your your battery runs and, and for amperage to make sure that they're matched. So with the Valance batteries, we can look at the software and we can see as they're discharging or charging, is the draw equal on each one of the batteries. Uh, we also can use a clamp amp, amp meter uh, and using that clamp amp meter, we can go through and test the the current flow during charge and discharge to make sure that it's all equal. And then the other thing that we'll do is we have a FLIR 1 uh, camera that is a thermal imaging camera that connects right into our iPhone. And we can just go through and look at the entire battery bank and instantly tell if we have a hot spot or not on the system. Did you have to prepare or condition the batteries before you installed them? Yeah, so when we got these batteries, they were all actually pre-charged. Um, they are all within a tenth of a volt, which was pretty slick. We probably could have just uh, set them up in series and then connected the series uh, packs into parallel and been done. But I didn't know anything about these batteries. So I ended up charging them all the way to the top and then discharging them all the way to their floor. So I understood how much capacity was in each one of the batteries. And it was amazing. Each one of these batteries has like 97% of the capacity that they were made with. It, it was nuts. So I did that just to learn about the batteries. Uh, but when I did that, I also needed to recharge them and equalize them across each other so that when I connected them in series, uh, they were in a tenth of a volt of each other. Uh, and then once I connected them, the BMS took care of the rest. It equalized across the entire series of batteries. So how did you mount these batteries in the boat? So another good question. So these particular batteries, because they're lithium ion phosphate and they don't have any liquid or anything else in them, you could mount them upside down if you wanted to. Uh, and that confused a lot of people because uh, when they saw these mounted in the boat, they said, gosh, they're not in a battery box and they're not uh, basically code uh, on the install in the boat. Uh, and that's actually not the case. So the code basically says there is only a particular amount of movement that you can have uh, of the batteries um, at, at roll or if they're inverted. Uh, and what we did is we put in these aluminum tracks and then we strapped them down all as one unit so they simply can't move uh, and then the other part is you need to make sure that all of your positive connections are covered do they get too hot in the engine room so the maximum temperature of these batteries is 55 degrees celsius which is 131 degrees fahrenheit um, so this engine room gets 20 degrees higher than the ambient temperature outside. And where we live, if it gets to 100 degrees, that's a spectacularly hot day. So that means that it's going to get up to about 120 degrees in this engine room. So we have a good 10 degrees buffer. So here's a good question. How long does it take to charge 21 kilowatts? So on our gen set or on shore power, uh, we're able to actually drive about 10,000 watts into these batteries. So we tend to try to recharge them when they hit about 50%, so about an hour. Uh, you know, if we go through an entire night through quiet hours where we don't wanna wake everybody up and charge the batteries because they're less than 50%, we'll drive them all the way down to zero. And by doing that, when it starts back up in the morning, it takes a little over two hours. How long can they run your inverter system? So the answer is it depends. Uh, if we're cooking and taking showers and you know running all of the AC units or heating with the, the AC units, um, we can burn it up in a day. Uh, so pretty much it would charge for two hours in the morning. We would go through pretty much all of that energy and by the time uh, the morning rolls around, it will charge it back up. However, if we're in the middle of the summer where we're, you know, it's pretty temperate and we don't have to really cool the boat or heat the boat. Um, and, you know, if you know, we take uh, kind of army showers, etc., uh, or we don't cook a lot, we can go 10 days uh, because we just don't burn down a lot of energy. So you have a 12 volt battery bank and a 48 volt battery bank. Why not just a 12 volt? There are a bunch of reasons that we did that. Uh, the first one is if we did 12 volt on this entire bank, 
um, it would have four times the current flow of what the 48 volt system has. Now the next one is, the Volt basically was built with two different types of appliances. You have electronics, you have lighting that runs on 12 volts. You also have other appliances like your microwave, uh, your hot water tank that run on 120 volts. Now, certainly we could have a battery bank that's 12 volts and we could step it up with an inverter to 120. However, by keeping both of these systems separate, um, we're able to basically keep the entire 12 volt system intact. Um, if we want to, we can charge the 12 volt system off of our 48 volt system. And if we ever lost our 48 volt system, um, we would always have the 12 volt system, which basically runs all of our you know, electronics, the autopilot, all those pieces, the lighting. So by doing this, we actually have some great redundancy in the boat. The last thing is, we talked about the BMS, um, and BMSs go through, and what do they do? They protect these batteries, and they protect the batteries by cutting them off if the voltage is too low. So think about that. So if we had this entire system set up as the 12 volt, and we were running our electronics off of it, and the BMS decided that the voltage is too low on the batteries, it would literally disconnect these batteries. That means our autopilot would be down, our electronics would be down, that the lighting would be down. So if you're out in the middle of, you know, Deception Pass with 14 knot currents, and all of a sudden all your systems shut down, that would be tragic. It's great for the batteries, it protects them, but it doesn't matter if your boat's on the rocks. Last question is, where do I get these batteries? There's a bunch of different suppliers. You can get them on eBay, um, Muller Industries. They have them from time to time as well. We'll provide some links below of common places that you can get these batteries, but sometimes you just have to search for them a little bit. But generally speaking, there's usually a pretty good inventory out there. So the FLIR 1 thermal camera, the amperage meter, the torque wrench, all of those things, we'll provide some links down below too if you're doing an install uh, and you want to be able to get any of those types of items to be able to complete your project. So thanks for watching. Uh, if you have any questions or you want more information, feel free to put some comments down below. We'll definitely answer them. Thanks for watching and hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you'll be notified of our upcoming videos and what we plan on talking about next time. Take care.